received him. Now this is talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist has been introduced into the text. And it says that, that John the Baptist wasn't the light, but that he was a witness to the light. And that there was a light that was sent from above that brought light into darkness. And that John the Baptist was a witness to this light. And those that received him, talking about Jesus now, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, that may not hit you like it hits me, but what, it, but what it's telling me is, is that the father had a plan to produce a family and to, to give birth to children. If you go to the next verse, it kind of tells us, even though you won't see the word cross there and you might see the word blood, but it's not being used the way you would think it is. It's talking about human blood. It's all talking about salvation. It's talking about the cross right here. He says, which were born not of blood, talking about the blood of man, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The will of God Amen. is how these children were birthed to give life so that they might be the children of God. For Peter talks about, we don't have to go there, but Peter talks about the fact that the way that that God the Father beget his children was through the sprinkling of blood, talking about the cross of Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead. Just as, just as there's a physical birth that takes place while a child is in the womb of its mother, a uh, gestation period, the truth of the matter is, is that whenever God's word is like a seed reaches into the heart of man, amen, it produces new birth. And so I think that just wanted to mention that that's just something that the Lord put on my heart here since we've been here this morning, that the privilege of being a, a son of God and how oftentimes we take for granted. I think we take for granted the privilege of having been exposed to the word of God, the privilege that the Holy Spirit put on our hearts to be receptive to the word of God. Listen, there's a whole world out there that will look at you like you goofy. Because you spent, you, you come to church, you know, you talk about the Lord, maybe you live your life differently than the way that the world does. And they look at you and they just don't understand. But I'm here to tell you, it's a privilege. Amen. That, hallelujah. Let me tell you something. If you've been, if you came out of something and you used to be in the midst of something and you know that the Lord delivered you from something, Amen. it's a privilege to be a child of God. We got folks in here that got a serious past, and we ain't got a whole lot of folks in here, but we got some folks in here that got a serious past, and every single one of us got something in common. It started off fun. Because it felt good to the flesh. But then there came a time and a place when it didn't feel that good anymore. And hallelujah, you were receptive to the truth of the gospel and the Holy Spirit moved on the inside of your heart. A seed was planted. A new birth took yeah. place. Amen. The Holy Ghost lives in your heart. Amen. Yeah. And you ain't never going to be the same. Amen. You can keep on dabbling with it. You can keep on going back to it. But the truth of the matter is now that God lives in your heart, you ain't never going to be the same. Amen. I want to talk to you about fathers this morning. And I chose a few different fathers to think, well, this is what the Lord had kind of put on my heart. We've been talking about Eli a little bit because we've been uh, transitioned from the book of Judges into Samuel on 1 Samuel on Wednesday nights. And so I want to talk to you first, two scriptures out of 1 Samuel. The first one comes out of uh, 1 Samuel chapter chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. The Bible says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So these boys were definitely not living for the Lord. They were doing things that were obviously contrary to the will of God. But if you'll remember, there was also in their life the fact that God said they were kicking against his sacrifice. Meaning they weren't even allowing the people to burn the fat to the Lord. They were taking whatever they wanted from the people. And so what we determined on Wednesday night was is that the way that they viewed the sacrifices that were supposed to be offered to God. is It, it could be talked about in the New Testament for a New Testament Christian for people who disregard the cross of Christ. God has an age old plan on how he will save mankind, how he will sanctify mankind. And it's always been through the shedding of innocent blood to pay the, pay the payment for the guilty. And so these boys here, while we see that they're living in carnal sin, there's a bigger problem than that. They don't even respect the sacrifice of God. 
And instead that they, they just push it off to the side. And the Bible says that they were actually sons of Belial. They weren't sons of God. They were sons of the devil. But God says, he, and, he, and he said unto them, I'm sorry, Eli is talking to his sons now. He said unto them, why do you such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all these people. The people are complaining to Eli about his boys. They're not living for God. They're doing things that are contrary to the ways of God. Eli is the leader of Israel. He represents the preacher. He represents any really today. I made this point too on Wednesday nights. Not trying to go off too much on you, but in too many rabbit trails. But you got to understand, this has always been a problem that I've had in my heart. Or I don't know if it's a problem or a good thing. That's one of the reasons I never wanted to quit my secular job. Because many times people in the church get the mindset that it's always the preacher's job to do the work of the ministry. But that's not even close to being true. That's, that's a lie from the pit of hell. The, the Bible is very clear in the fact that well, even if you go back to the book of, in, in, well, in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, the far, first five books of the Bible, Moses makes the comment, whenever there's too much work for him to do and the Holy and God tells him, he says, listen, I'm going to take the same spirit that's on you. I'm putting it on 70 other people so that they can help you to work in a ministry. And then there was one guy that was still over at the camp and they were prophesying in the camp, not necessarily where everybody thought that they should be. And I'm thinking it was Joshua. I'm kind of shooting from the hip here. Joshua comes running back to Moses. And he says, they over there prophesying in the camp where they ought not to be. You need to stop them. And Moses said, you do this out of envy for me. Like, in other words, you're worried that my leadership or the way people are going to view me is going to be lowered because somebody else is doing the work of the ministry. God forbid it. I would that all God's people would prophesy. Amen. Yeah, amen. See, that's a prophecy right there. Moses speaking a prophecy that one day God was going to do that. God did that on the day of Pentecost. Well, after Jesus died and went to the after Jesus went to the cross and died and resurrected and ascended to the Father, he told the disciples, he said, Tarry for me in Jerusalem, wait for me in that upper room. He said, You're going to receive the gift of my Father after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Right. And, and the Word of God says that on that day, on that day, whenever they were there in that upper room, the Holy Spirit descended like tongues of fire upon them. They began to speak in other tongues, but the whole purpose of that was on the day of Pentecost, they were filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. They received the anointing of God. They received the power and the anointing to what? To be witnesses for God. It's God's will that all his people be right. witnesses and evangelists for the kingdom That's of right. God. Right. Hallelujah. Because God desires that the whole world, listen to me, you can't shrink down the preacher. I used to say that you can't shrink down the preacher and stick him in your pocket. And whenever you're on the workplace or, or you're in Walmart or, and the door opens up. Have you ever prayed, God, open up a door so that I might tell somebody about you? And then all of a sudden the door opens up and they like, oh, what am I going to do? But you, know, you can't pull the preacher out and pour some water on him. And then all of a sudden he grows up and, you know, and he's going to do the work. No, the work of the ministry is for you and I, the people of God, to be a light in the midst of darkness. To tell the hurting world out there the truth. Amen. Anyway, I went off on a rabbit trail there, but the point that I wanted to make to you was, is that, yes, Eli represents the preacher, but everybody's supposed to do the work of the ministry. And Eli says, no, nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear you make the Lord's people to transgress. So Eli's boys, he's a father, he's got sons, are not living properly for the Lord. Now let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, because we're going to talk about Samuel. So same book, a few chapters over. This is the, I used a study Bible when I copied and pasted this particular passage of scripture. And my study Bible has Israel asks for a king. If y'all are familiar with the time frame that's going on, you know that that was a big thing in and of itself. But that's not what we're focused on. It says it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre. That's another word for money. Took bribes and perverted judgment. And then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. And said unto him, Behold, you are old, and your sons walk not in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all other nations. Now this grieved Samuel that they were asking 
for a king. And I don't really want to get ahead of myself, but at this point, I do want to take just a second and make a, po make, make a point that we have two examples of fathers right here. We have Eli, we have Samuel. Eli's boys are definitely not living for the Lord. The, the scripture is very clear that Samuel's boys are not living for the Lord. To be fair to Eli, he was responsible for raising Samuel. Samuel was a mighty man of God, amen, and lived for the Lord. Hallelujah. The point that I'm trying to make, though, is, is that both of these men were men of God that loved God. But at the same time, their offspring didn't serve God. One of the things that I believe, I wrote a paper when I was in Bible college about this, and I got blasted by some people that, in, in my mind, I felt like they were kind of simple-minded and they couldn't see the point that I was trying to make. But, of course, we're always going to try to defend our, the way we see things. Something, in my mind, something's happening here. I know that the Bible's silent on it, not explaining it in detail. But one of the things that we have, that's why context is so important. One of the contexts of this when I tell you this, because we're studying it, so hopefully at least it will enter into your mind. What was going on, this is the time frame of the judges. We're not yet into the truly into the time frame of the kings yet. We're in the time frame of the judges. What's going on in society right now in the time frame of the judges that, that, that could have affected the upbringing of these boys? The scripture repeatedly says in the book of Judges, what is it? I've, I've told you this a million times that there was no king in those days and the people did what was right in their own eyes. God always planned to give Israel a king, but he wanted to give them a king that was after his own heart. God desired to groom David. I, listen, we don't have time to break it down and to prove it through scripture. We've done it multiple times. God always had a desire to groom David. As a matter of fact, when he fell into sin with Bathsheba, the Lord told David, he said, I took you from the sheep coat. In other words, what he was saying is, is that I placed you in a, in a specific spot so that I could groom you and teach you how to take care of them little sheep in that pasture land to give you a heart that would love those sheep so that you could turn around and love my sheep and take care of my people the way that I wanted them taken care of. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. You can judge him, you can judge other men for the failures that they've made, but the truth of the matter is, is that at the core of David's heart, he loved the Lord his God, he wanted to serve the Lord his God, and he wanted to do the will of the Lord his God, right? But during this time, but, but listen, during this time frame, we're in judges. There is no king. The, there's a bigger problem right there. That means that the people don't want God to be their king. God's going to give them a king, but until he's ready to do it in his timing, he wants the people, his people, to allow him to be the king of their hearts. But because God's not the king of their hearts, society is rampant with sin, and this is the context, this is the atmosphere in which these boys are being raised. Am I trying to say that it's all that fault on why these boys didn't serve the Lord? No, but are we going to sit here and pretend that that didn't have an effect on them? The main point that I bring that up for is for you today to understand if you're a father, you're living in a similar society today. You're living in a society today where sin is rampant. Listen to me. The world does not recognize God as king of their life. And in America, each and every day, less and less people are recognizing God as king in their life. Amen. And because of that, the Bible says there was no king in the land in those days and people did what was right in their own eyes. People are beginning to live their life in such a way that whatever they feel good about, whatever they desire to do, that is what they're going to do. And that's how they're going to handle their business. We are living in the same society today that they were living in then. You have a task ahead of you. If you have children, if you're a father, if you're a mother and you're raising children in today's society, let me tell you something. This society, the, at, the, the condition of the atmosphere, of, of the air, of the prince of the power of darkness is not going to help you raise your children to be a godly seed. It's Amen. against you. It's fighting against you every step of the way. Now, I would just want to make that point clear. Right? Amen. All right. So there's two fathers. You got Eli. You got Samuel. Now, there were two more fathers that I got out of this uh, next passage of Scripture. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Does anybody know who wrote the Proverbs? For the most Solomon. part, Solomon, that's right. Solomon wrote the Proverbs, the books of wisdom. And this is Solomon talking, and look, look how he starts it. He says, my son. So he's talking to his boy. 
My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Now, I got to always stop sometimes and try to make a point. When, you, when I've tried to ask, I've tried to, I can't lie to you. I don't want to call it brainwashing. That'd be weird to say that because people accuse preachers of being brainwashing. But I have tried to formulate a thought in your mind that when you see the word commandment and law, what do you think of when you see the word commandment of law for Old Testament people? It should be the Bible. You should see the Bible when you see that. You shouldn't see a book of rules. For Israel, the law, listen, this gets deep and I don't want to get too deep this morning. The, all of the law is Torah. The word Torah means instruction and all of the Torah is law. The point being is that the Old Testament, which is known as Torah and law, the whole thing. Yes, the first five books is known as law, but the whole Old Testament was considered by Israel to be law and Torah, instruction from God. The Old Testament for Israel was their instruction, their word. The whole scripture is the instruction and word for us. It's in unity and it's our counsel from God that we receive. I just wanted to make that point because this is what Solomon's saying to his son. Lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live my law as the apple of thine eye. God would say that to Solomon. Solomon would say that to his son. The word of the commandment of God, the law of God is the word of God. Tie a little bow around your finger. I remember when I, when I was a kid, I used to get in trouble all the time because of my anger problems. And then one time mama brought me to a psychiatrist and they said, well, you can either tie a string to your finger to remind, I ain't walking around with a string on my finger, dude, really. Or you can bite your finger. <laughs> bite your finger instead of being mad at somebody and hitting them or something like that. Well, what Solomon is trying to say is a reminder, tie, tie the law of God around your finger. Wear it like a little ring to remind you of God's word. He says, uh, he says, let it let your, the law be an apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the table of your heart. Say unto wisdom. Now he's gonna he's personifying wisdom like it's a sister that's got that got something to offer. But we're gonna talk about wisdom a little bit towards the end. And, and look at this. You are my sister. Call understanding your kinswoman. Wisdom and understanding of God are your relatives. You need to love them. That they may keep you from the strange woman. Now, what Solomon's doing, we're not getting into this whole proverb. I love teaching this proverb, but that's not my point here. Solomon's about to create a scenario. And the scenario that he's creating is he's instructing his son. Whether this is before or after his own failure, because everybody knows Solomon made some major mistakes also, right? For the Bible to say that he was the wisest man in the world, that, that uh, basically that existed, he made a whole lot of mistakes. He married a whole lot of women. See, not only is there a problem in society sometimes, but there's always a tempter lurking around the corner trying to get you to go the way you're not supposed to go. Yeah. Solomon went the wrong way. He connected himself to multiple women. And the problem was, is that he could have had God. I'm not saying God allowed that back then. As a matter of fact, God never said it was okay for them to do that. He always said, let the, let the man leave his father and mother cleave unto his wife. Let them be one flesh, right? But the truth is, is that they, they did what they did and they would have multiple wives. But God definitely said, don't be going to grab a wife from Egypt. Don't be grabbing a wife from the Ammonites because they're going to draw your heart away from me. And that's what Solomon did. He married all these women and he built altars for them. So that they could worship their false gods and he brought false religion into Israel. It was a major mistake that Solomon did. But he's he, in this proverb, he's really, it talks about a prostitute, but it's really more about false religion. Prostit the false religion disguises itself the way that this woman does. So whether this is before his fall or after his fall, I don't really know. But I know one thing. He's trying to instruct his son to prepare him. And he's describing a scenario where a young man that's void of the understanding of God. In other words, ultimately, that's where we're going to end up today is at the understanding of God. To be able to see things and begin to perceive things the way that God perceives things. It's another privilege. To be the son of God, but also to gain the understanding of God in the midst of a society that's broken and full of sin. To be able to see things more the way God does than the world around you, the people around you that don't understand God, that don't have a clue of God. And this, he, he tells his son, he, he goes on to say, 
that they may keep you from the strange woman, from the stranger which flatters with her words. Once again, this is really talking about false teaching, false doctrine, a false way. He says, I looked out the window of my house. I looked through my casement, another word for lattice, and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man that was void of understanding. A simple person in the book of Proverbs describes, and I'm going to get into it a little bit more here in a second, but essentially it's somebody that's void of the understanding of God. At this point in time, they're just ignorant. They're ignorant of the things of God. And Solomon desires to instruct his son so that he doesn't grow up to be a child that's void of the understanding of God. And so... I have to tell you that I believe with all of my heart, once again, sometimes I do read between the lines, but I believe with all my heart that David would have instructed Solomon this way, and now Solomon is instructing his own son this way. Because this is how Israel, it's well known, this is how the Israelite people taught the word of God to their children. Through oral tradition, they would take time and again to instruct their children in the ways of God. They would remind them of the Passover. They would remind them of all of the laws. And they would repeatedly talk to them about the word of God. Listen to me. When we're talking about fathers this morning, I'm talking about instruction. When we're talking about fathers this morning, we're in a church. And we're supposed to talk about Christian fathers, I believe. We're supposed to talk about fathers that revere and respect the word of God. They're, and we're supposed to teach our children... The ways of God. Listen, there's a lot of things that fathers can teach their children, and those are good things. A father should just be an instructor, I believe. I mean, not just be an instructor. That, that completely came out wrong. A father should instruct at all times. I can remember my dad. Look, my dad could fix some stuff. And I think he learned from his dad. My dad could fix anything, I believe. I mean, it seemed like it anyway. There's nothing wrong with the, dish, the washing machine. There ain't no sense in calling no, nobody to come fix that. He'd tear that thing apart, put it back together. Every single time I tried to go ask him what he was doing in the garage, I'm not going to say what he'd say because <laughs> we would have to bleep it off the tape. But essentially, he'd say, what he was saying was, get the you-know-what out of here, boy. Like, I aggravated you that bad, dude? Yeah, obviously he did. Probably because, well, I don't want to say that. I'm going to be nice to that. Basically, though, he never took the time to instruct me. Now, is it my dad's fault that now I hate to try to fix anything? No, it's not. It's really my own fault. But the point being is, is that there was no, and that was what he knew. He knew how to fix stuff. And he never really imparted any of that wisdom to me. So the truth be told is, is that fathers can impart all kind of wisdom to their children. Whether it be learning how to catch fish, whether it be learning how to kill animals, you know, to clean an animal, to, you know, you get the point that I'm trying to make. There's a lot of ways that fathers can instruct their children. I know I'm using a lot of words this morning, but we're in a church and the main point that I'm trying to make is, is that we're talking about, we're supposed to be talking about Christian fathers this morning and the responsibility of Christian fathers to teach their children the ways of God. Amen. Amen. And so we have as examples these fathers. We have Eli, we have Samuel living in the midst of a wicked society. We have David who I believe would have taught Solomon the ways of God. And then Solomon desiring to teach his children the ways of God. And we have a world that's filled with simple people. And when I say simple, this is old King James language, so don't get offended. But essentially what it means is in this context... People that are void, empty of the understanding of God. So Christian fathers should do what Solomon was doing. Even though Solomon didn't get it all right, he was desiring to instruct his child in the ways of God. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 1 verses 1 through 11. It's going to use a lot of the words that I want to talk about really at the end of this message, but... This is Solomon writing this proverb, and he says, To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Whenever I study the Bible, I like, man, I, that's why I love having these little tools up in my phone, and all I got to do is just tap on there, and boom. 
Because when I see a word like equity, I'm like, you know what, dude, this is old King James language, but there's something to that word. And essentially it means the right thing. Whenever you read in the book of Proverbs and it talks about God hates an, un, like a, a, an unbalanced scale, there's some, you, you, what does that even mean? You know what I'm saying? You've got to start digging around a little bit to do a little bit of study. But essentially, God's all about fairness. God's all about doing the right thing. People, he's created people with an understanding and an ability to perceive what is right versus what is wrong. Amen. And a skewed scale. If somebody puts rocks on there that are heavier than what they're supposed to be, so it manipulates the weight whenever you're doing a business transaction, it's basically the same thing as cheating on your taxes, kind of. It's like God doesn't like that. He hates an unbalanced scale. He hates when people don't do the right thing. He, he, he wants people to make equity judgment. He wants people to do the right thing. To give subtlety to the simple. Now this word subtlety, as a matter of fact, we can break it down a little bit right now. Subtlety describes a wisdom that allows one to make the right decisions at the right times. That's basically what Solomon was trying to do for his son. He's like, listen, son, I'm just letting you know. I watched a young man void of understanding before he was walking down the road. He was heading to a bad place. I want to prepare you ahead of time for if you're ever walking down the road and it's near the twilight of night and you're going to the wrong area so that whenever that time frame comes and it's time for you to make a decision, you can make the right decision. That's what it means. Subtlety means to be able to make the right decisions at the right times. And listen, subtlety for the simple. The word simple. I like this, this word. It, the word has both the idea of naive, which just means to lack knowledge, and open-minded. I'm going to get back to this in a second, but I want you to understand just because you're lacking knowledge doesn't make you a fool because sometimes people that lack knowledge have open mindedness and they're willing to learn. Simple people can be taught. Amen. They just have to be taught. You can't expect a child who doesn't know the ways of God to respond according to the ways of God if, if they don't know the way. But, but the point is, is that every time there, there was a conversation before, I kept saying, repeating the same thing, expecting the world to behave like the church. The world ain't going to behave like the church. The world doesn't have the Holy Ghost living in their heart. And if you expect sinners to act like Christians, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. Half the time, the church folk don't act like church folk. Come on, somebody, help me out. Half the time preachers don't act like church folk. So anyway, the, the point is, is that is that the simple, though, are willing to learn. Amen. So to the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. You already see the difference between the two, right? Might be simple, but the word of God is going to prepare someone, give them the weapons, the arsenal that they need in order to operate in this life with the understanding of God. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. It's called a dark saying because it's kind of like a riddle. When you read a proverb, it's like a parable where two where things are compared and contrasted. And sometimes you really got to think and you got to ponder in order to be able to figure out what God's really desiring to say. Right. Take some work sometimes to, to gain the understanding of God. Work, what I mean by that is you can't earn the understanding of God, but to work with the scripture, to learn God's ways. But look at this. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of your father. Forsake not the law of your mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace to your head. Chains upon your neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. For let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Basically, what they're talking about is, I mean, it sounds like a mugging. It sounds like they're scheming a mugging. Let's wait behind the corner. When they come around, we're going to get them. But the idea is, is that really what's going on here is that the world is scheming to do things that are contrary to the ways of God. The, 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 the proverb teacher is trying to teach don't lie and wait with them. Don't connect yourself with the people of the world that are going to scheme things that are opposite of the ways of God. Instead, gain the understanding of God. Let the simple learn, right? Whenever, 
one of the ideas of the simple, once again, is that they're naive and that they have a lack of experience, judgment, or information. This is another reference to the fact that a father can instruct, but if a child is unwilling to learn. See, that's what I want to say. I believe Eli instructed his children. I believe Samuel instructed his children. But just because a father instructs doesn't mean a child's willing to learn. Amen. So wisdom cannot be gained if instruction is given, but a child is unwilling to learn. The simple and the fool are not exactly alike. F fools are simple. All fools are simple, but not all simple are fools. What are you trying to say? Well, a fool doesn't understand. Remember, the simple person doesn't have the understanding of God. All fools don't have the understanding of God, but not all people that don't have the understanding of God are fools. In other words, a fool is a person that rejects and spurns the counsel of God. Doesn't want to hear it. Doesn't want to know the things of God. Get, gets bored whenever you start to talk about the things of God. Look at this. Proverbs 50 and 5. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures real quick. I'm not going to keep you here too long today. Just bear with me. I know this is a teaching. You had not heard you shout yet, but it's all good. Proverbs 15, 5 says that a fool despises his father's instruction, but he that regards reproof is prudent. To regard means to take notice of, to pay attention to, to learn from. It's a smart thing. Whenever you're instructed in the ways of God, not to despise it, but instead to receive it, right? Proverbs 26, 4 through 5. This is talking about fools now, people that refuse to hear instruction, people that refuse to hear the word of God. Because I'm trying to give fathers a little bit of a break because sometimes even if we do the instruction, right. children don't want to listen, right? It says, answer not a fool according to his folly. In other words, what that's saying, you know what a folly is? It's like a mischievous act of something that was wrong. And he's saying, don't address a fool when you see him doing something wrong. Then he turns around and he says, he says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So he's saying, when you see somebody do a foolish thing and you know he's a fool, don't try to bring correction in his life because now you're going to make yourself a fool. Then he says, when you see a fool doing something that you're not supposed to do, you need to bring correction in his life because if you don't, he's going to think that he, he's getting away with something. What are you talking about? You're contradicting. Oh, Lord, this is one of the places where people told me that their Bible contradicts itself. No, it's not. God's trying to say no matter what you do for a fool, it ain't going to help him. You can try to help him. You can try not to help him. But no matter what you do, a fool is despising the wisdom of God and nothing is going to help them. Nothing that you tell them. If you, okay, but and let me tell you why, because it says right here, Proverbs 27, 22, though you should bray a fool in a mortal among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. Boy, this is some major terminology. See, when I see stuff like this, I'm like, what in the world is God saying right here? Well, I know what a mortal and a pestle is. I mean, it has something to do with what them pharmacists use, right? That little bowl with that little thing in there and they stick stuff up in there and they crush it up and they mix it up. Because what he's talking about is he's talking about separation. When you take wheat and you stick it in something like that, you start pounding it and rubbing it, you know what's going to happen is you're going to separate the husk from the grain. A separation takes place. What the Lord's saying is you can take a fool, a person who despises the instruction of God, the ways of God, the understanding of God. You can stick him in a mortal. You can, I, think, I think I'm saying it right. The mortar's the bone. Okay. You can stick him in the mortar. You can take the pestle and you can pound him and you can grind him. And you can roll him around in there, but you ain't never going to separate the foolishness from him because it's in his DNA and it's there to stay. He don't want to learn the ways of God. He rejects the word of God. I would just like to reiterate the fact that for Samuel and Eli, I believe that their fathers, the way that their children turned out was connected to some extent to the society that they lived in. I've said it once before. I'm going to say it again. We live in a similar type society. That doesn't respect the word of God as instruction for a person's life. Just as it was repeatedly voiced in the book of Judges, so it is today. There was no king, so the people did what was right in their eyes. Once again, the citizens of this country were getting more and more that way. We're seeing it more and more on television. They're inundating us. They're desensitizing us. Every, almost every single show that you see on television now has a gay relationship in it. 
I mean, I'm not even trying to make a bigger deal about homosexuality than any other kind of sin because the Lord gave me a revelation of that a long time ago that there's really no, not, no difference when it comes to sin. Sin is yeah. sin. Amen. We've been seeing. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is, is that there's a concerted effort to change the way. Matter of fact, I was watching a, a show the other day and they had this deal where this guy called somebody a, you know, a negative term regarding homosexual. And, and the guy was actually kind of tough for a home. You know, you don't expect homosexuals always to be tough, but you'd be surprised sometimes, I guess. And this, and this old boy said, dude, this is the 20th century. Like, in other words, and, be, and ended up beating him up. And so, in other words, we're, we're now living in the 20th century. Everybody's accepting of this. Everybody's accepting of people being able to do what they want. There's no king of our heart. We do what we want to do, right? And once again, fathers face similar tasks to what Samuel and Eli face. Look at this. But just because we're facing this in the midst of society, God's word says that fathers, God's people have been given a command by God. Look at Proverbs 22, 6. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. But look, this thought, I just want you to, to bear with me. So if Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, we're talking somewhere probably about 900 B.C., somewhere around that, 950 B.C. Okay, but this, whenever Solomon said this in Proverbs, it didn't stop with him. Look, look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Now we're talking about A.D. 50. So about a thousand years later, God's word still says... In Ephesians 6, 4, you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The word nurture means to the whole training and education of God. It talks about the cultivation of the mind and the morals. When you cultivate land to produce a harvest, it takes work. That means you don't just throw out some little Bible passage every now and then to your son, but instead you're watching them, you're observing their behavior, you're telling them certain things. When you see that they're going the wrong way, you're intervening and you're discussing certain things with them. You're cultivating them. I, I, I've told you all this before. I saw this woman one time like, I can't believe it that, that we should pass a law that prevents Christians from sending their kids to these Christian camps. They're brainwashing their children. The world hates the fact that we're trying that we would teach our children the ways of God. That we would try to intervene if they're if we perceive their thinking to be wrong. Now, I gotta be honest with you. My kids have turned out, I feel like they're pretty smart. And they're and listen, sometimes their views are a little bit different than mine on certain things, especially things that are that are going on in today's society. And there's been times I'm glad that I always allowed them to talk and I just didn't tell them to shut up because I was the daddy. I'm not saying I never said that, <laughs> but I'm saying for the most part, I did let them talk. And there's been times here recently that we've had conversations that I could see as I let them talk. If I was honest with myself, that I had that I could understand the perception that they were coming from. OK, but that doesn't mean that that I'm still not going to try to influence and to say what it is. And they're going to have to work it out in their own mind, ultimately, what God's will would be. Right. But so the word nurture describes the whole training and education of a child and admonitions means to call attention to it as a mild rebuke or a warning. So when you hear something, you're over here trying to train somebody in the right way. And every now and then you hear something that is of the wrong way. So you're going to bring a warning. You're going to bring a rebuke, a word of correction to let them know, hey, I think that the way that you're going right there is wrong. So this this thought wasn't new. So so listen, it didn't end with Proverbs. But guess what? It existed before Proverbs. Look at Genesis chapter 18, verses nine, verse 19. And while they're getting it up on the screen, I want to ask you a question. When you think of Abraham, what do you think of when you think of Abraham? Well, there's a lot of different things you could think of. Of faith. What? Father of the faith. Father of the faith. I was glad that you said that because that was what I was looking for. Father. The word father. Father of the faith. What are you talking about? God called this man Abraham out from amongst a, 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 a mass of nations that didn't know God and he said from this one man I'm going to make a nation to myself and through this one man I'm going to give a seed to the world and the seed is Jesus and through this seed I'm going to beget 
children that will be my sons and my daughters and I will be their God. But look what God said about Abraham, why he wanted to know Abraham. He says, for I know him. This is why I know him right here. That, that's what that means. This is why I know him. This is why I've made myself known to him. So that he will command his children and his household after him and they will shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. God said, hey, I called Abraham out from amongst a sea of nations that did not know me because I had a purpose for him. And the purpose that I had for him was that I would create a nation through him but and that there would be a seed that would come from him. But what I'm asking him to do is to make sure that he instructs his seed and his offspring that are going to be this nation to know me and to follow after me because this is my plan. This is what I plan to do from the beginning is to create an eternal family that will spend an eternity with me. Amen. Listen, Leonard Ravenhill, he's a great revivalist, made the comment well before, and I've said it before, that this life that we live today is nothing but a dress rehearsal for eternity. Yes. If you don't believe that, I can't help you any more than that. I, if, if not, then this world certainly doesn't make much sense. Right. Just a bunch of chaos, a bunch of emptiness doesn't make any sense whatsoever. What would be the purpose of the existence of this higher intelligent creature? That can make a connection and know that there's a God if there's just a bunch of emptiness left, right? I'm closing with this concept here that four words are repeatedly used in the book of Proverbs. And I believe that they build upon themselves because ultimately one of the things that I've tried to make the point today is this. Is that it's a privilege to gain the understanding of God. Amen. 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 The understanding of God, though, is a process. Amen. It don't just happen overnight. No. You don't wake up one morning and say, oh, by the way, I have the understanding of God. And I believe a big part of it is because I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> it don't happen like that. Amen. Right? There's a big process to it. And a big part of it has to do with you and I each and every day. We started off this message. I don't think anything's an accident to talk about the evangelism of God. God calling us to be an evangelist, Right? You allow the light that's in you to come out and into other people. They either reject it, the fool rejects it. The simple that's open-minded receives it. The simple one that's open-minded, he's void of the understanding of God, but he received the Spirit of God, and now he's on his way to learning the understanding of God. Amen? But it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. The first step in the process, and a word that you will repeatedly see in the book of Proverbs, is knowledge. Knowledge is the first step towards understanding. The knowledge of God is a prerequisite to knowing God. In order to gain an understanding of God, a person must gain an understanding of God's word. When we're talking about knowledge, we're not talking about how to learn how to fix a washing machine. We're not talking about learning how to shoot a deer, clean a deer. We're not, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about learning how to catch fish. We're talking about Understand, learning, gaining the knowledge and insight of the word of God. Amen. A man will never be able to instruct his children in the ways of God if he himself has not learned the word of God. It is a father's responsibility to impart the knowledge of God to his children. And that brings me to the next one, which is instruction. Probably don't should move too fast. Well, how do you know? Be how do you know that? Because it's repeated that the people of God... As fathers instructed their children in God's ways. It ha it's all throughout the Old Testament. Amen. Right? So knowledge is uh, gaining an understanding of the, or, or gaining the information, if you will, of the word of God. But in order for that to happen, the word instruction comes into place. Two main words in the word of instruction of the Hebrew, doctrine and discipline. Y'all know what doctrine means, right? That's actually a good baby right there. That baby hardly hadn't made any noise, man. You know what I'm saying? He had tried to out preach the preacher. He's a very good baby. Appreciate your respect. The word doctrine means instruction. Right? And and but it also has the word discipline. See, when a person instructs another in any type of knowledge, the right information is given. I've already said this a little bit once. So when you instruct someone, you give them the right information, but the wrong information is also corrected. I used to get into arguments with preachers that I used to know. Like, dude, you act like 
you act like you gotta you gotta defend the faith. The, the, look at Titus chapter one verse nine. It says, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. He's talking about what a preacher is supposed to do. Paul writes a letter to Titus and says, this is what you need to do, preacher. <laughs> Hold fast. Cling to the faithful word, the word of God, as it was taught to you. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort, to lift up the people of God, and convince the gainsayers. Now, listen to me. Sometimes these words in the old King James, that's why I'm telling you, it's not necessarily a bad thing to get a different translation if you're using it more as a commentary to compare to the two. And we're not going to get into why we use the King James this morning. But what I but I do, there's another Bible translation that I use sometimes to see what it's saying. Uh, but I don't like the underlying manuscripts, but it's a word for word. But listen, it is what it says. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. So that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So don't tell me, preacher, that the preacher is not supposed to rebuke those people who contradict the sure, trustworthy doctrine of God. So the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that if a father is a Christian father and he's trying to give impart knowledge to his Christian child... That sometimes the word doctrine, instruction, and discipline are connected. You teach the right thing, but you also refute and rebuke the wrong thing. Right? The next thing on the list is wisdom. This is another word that's used. I only got one more after this. Just bear with me. Three minutes. The next word on the list is wisdom. Knowledge. Would you all agree? I mean, I don't mean to try to belabor a point, but would you all agree that when you first got saved, you didn't know anything about the Word of God? Amen. I try to talk to people all the time because it's, for me, it's a major revelation that the love of God came from another realm. I tell you all this all the time. First John chapter three, verse one. What manner of love is this that the Lord has bestowed upon us that he, we would be called the sons of God? The word manner there means it comes from another tribe. What it means is that it's foreign. The idea there is that God's love is foreign to our hearts and minds. What does that mean? It means that even though you may love something, more than likely at the core of your love, there's still a selfish motive. You understand what I'm getting at? Can we be honest with one another? We want something in return for our love, right? God wasn't that way. Right. God Amen. so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Praise God. The one who never failed, the one who never thought a wrong thought, the darling of heaven that spoke the worlds into existence, God allowed him to become flesh for the whole purpose that he would die on a cross to pay the penalty of man's sin. Not his sin. He had no sin, but your sin, my sin. So why? So that we could be called the sons of God. Yeah. That's a selfless love. It's foreign to our mindset. But not only is the love of God foreign to our mindset, His Word is foreign to our mindset. It's a completely different language. It's a foreign language that has to be learned and cultivated. And it has to be, the mind has to be washed. we got to be brainwashed. Yeah, it sounds crazy to people that, oh, you go to a cult, man. I heard that preacher on YouTube. He said you need to be brainwashed. You need your brainwashed, man. <laughs> you need your brainwashed. So that because of the society that you've been inundated by, that you've been growing up in, that has influenced you through the spirit of disobedience that works in the children of disobedience, that has affected your mindset and the way that you think, you need God's word, the knowledge of God's word, the instruction of God's word to come into your heart and to begin to wash your brain and to begin to change your mind and your understanding so that you can now take that knowledge and begin to apply it in your daily life. We're talking about wisdom, right? That's what wisdom is, the application of the knowledge of God. You can learn, until you learn the knowledge of God, you'll never be able to apply it. I talk to you about this a lot, but so, so I'm a nurse practitioner, I was a nurse. Both of those studies, just like, but it's just like being an electrician, it, it's just like being a plumber. What I'm saying is there's a technical aspect to people's job occupations. Right? You got to learn some science. I'm saying science and medicine, but guess what? There's still science and elect electricity to some extent. I don't understand that kind of science, but there's some science in that. Well, you better know which wires you can touch and which ones you can't. You got to know the difference between a red and a blue and whatever. You, there's, a, there's learning that's in a book many times that tells you right from wrong, touch this, don't touch that, put that there, the current goes this way. 
But then every day you got to take the knowledge you learn and you got to go apply it in the field. That's the same thing with the Word of God. You learn the knowledge of God, but you're given each and every day an opportunity to apply that and turn it into wisdom. Wisdom is the application of God's knowledge in everyday life. You're going to be faced with circumstances and opportunities. Listen to me, it happened to you last week probably. Somebody said something to you that was cocky or mean, and you had an opportunity. The Bible says that even the fool is considered wise when he shuts his lips. Amen. <laughs> so come on, somebody. The only point that I'm really trying to make right now is this, is that we learn the knowledge of God, but then each and every day we have the opportunity to apply it. It becomes Amen. the wisdom of God. Sometimes when we attempt to apply that, we fail. Amen. And guess what? Even in failures, wisdom is gained. Right. What are you talking about? Because when you don't do it the right way, you learn from that life lesson. And then later on, you're going to be given another opportunity to come back around that, that, that trial. And when you face it again, you will have learned from the past. Amen. And now you can apply the knowledge of God this time. So don't be beating yourself up whenever you, whenever you fail to do it the way that the Lord would have had you to do it. Because you're going to be given another opportunity. Amen. As we learn, the Word of God every day poses opportunities to practice and apply, and ultimately this results in a lifelong process known as understanding. To have the understanding of God, I've already said it is an absolute privilege in a society that disregards God's Word in ways that remains a people, though, and that's us, that's the church, the people of God, amen, that have access to the heart and mind of God. That's a privilege, that you and I have access to the heart and mind in God. You know, the full... He doesn't always have to stay a fool, but the fool would say that this is not the word of God. They would say that this is the word of man. God didn't write this book. Man wrote Amen. this book. That's a lie. The Bible says of itself that it's theonoustos. God breathed. Theo, God, noustos, breath. God breathed. God breathed in man and through man. I try to Amen. talk to these smart people all the time. God breathed in man through man and so that his word could be written on paper so that it could be read by man. Amen. And I like to talk to smart people. Like, How do you want God to communicate to you, man? You want him to float down in all his glory and reveal. You want to be able to poke him in his belly and touch him and know that he's real. No, that's not faith. God communicates to man through human language. Man communicates through language. God condescended himself so that he could lower himself so that he could communicate himself to mankind. This is his word. Amen. But people will reject it as God's word. And if they're going to do that, then they're always going to remain a fool because they're despising the instruction of God. Without instruction, there is no knowledge. Without knowledge, there can be no wisdom. Without the exercise of wisdom, there will never be the privilege of understanding. And it's the father's job to instruct whether the child will receive the instruction or not.